Welcome to this session on physical therapy treatment patterns and outcomes. Does manual therapy matter? Today we have three presenters and in order of their presentations, they are Dr. Randy Lee, Dr. Catherine Miller, and Ms. Dong Chung Wang. You can read about each of these presenters in your conference materials. So without further ado, I will pass things over to Dr. Randy Lee. Thank you, John, and good afternoon, everyone. Over the past year, our research team has been broadly studying physical therapy treatment patterns and outcomes. As a result of that, more unanswered or partially answered research questions have emerged that could serve as topics for more explicit study, but we chose three. And of those three, we started by trying to answer the question, does manual therapy matter in regard to, for example, disability duration and costs? In the next short 20 minutes, we hope to answer two questions at a very high level. First, what is manual therapy? Second, why do we study manual therapy? And then we'll also share some preliminary findings on manual therapy treatment patterns and outcomes. So how do you define manual therapy? Manual therapy is one of the oldest treatments known to medicine, even used by Hippocrates. However, I couldn't have defined it when I came out of my orthopedic residency in 1985. And if asked, I would have probably said, I don't know, and it's not real or true medicine anyway, partly because of my prideful orthopedic biases at the time but also because there was little to no research on the topic, at least in the United States. Now the opinions and research about manual therapy have changed over the years, and Dr. Miller is gonna tell us more about that in just a moment. But the definition and topic can still be confusing. Descriptions can vary based on where you practice geographically, the type of provider administering, administering the treatment, as there are all types of providers in the mix now, and because a universally accepted nomenclature surrounding manual therapy is lacking, resulting in such things as different names being used for similar treatments. The simplest definition for manual therapy can be found by looking at the Latin root word origin of the word manual, which is manus and means the hand. So if we use physical therapy as an example, manual therapy is a subgroup of physical therapy treatments that are delivered hands-on as opposed to other types of therapy that are more hands-off, such as supervised exercise that we talked about just a moment ago. Well, it's hands-on, but what are some of the most commonly used manual therapy treatments called? How do they work? And what histologic tissues do they target? Is it soft tissue, joints, or both areas? And the answer is yes, it's all three. For soft tissues, that is muscles, tendons, ligaments, and fascia, Th manual therapy allegedly relieves spasm or helps break up scar tissue or adhesions within those tissues. It includes massage and can include other methods such as those that are instrument assisted. And you might hear names or terms such as the Graston or ASTEM techniques and technology, or perhaps dry needling to break up a tr painful trigger point. Active release, myofascial release, or both terms used for manual treatments which reportedly release painful muscle and fascial trigger points. But it may not always be a soft tissue problem. It could be the joint, and for joints, mobilization is the manual therapy most often mentioned here. There are any number of maneuvers used by different types of providers that perform mobilizations that are all delivered with varying force, speed, and amplitude, and all of which helps increase the motion of a joint, which in turn should help restore normal joint mechanics and thus decrease the pain. And then you could have a soft tissue problem and a joint problem. One example here of techniques used would be uh, the combined techniques, and you might have heard of muscle energy techniques, which are reported to increase joint motion and lengthen shortened muscles. One final and important question many of you might have asked as a payer or employer to a provider is this, what are the indications for manual therapy? And frankly, there is lack of complete clarity about each and every indication for manual therapy, but here's what we do know. It's based on physical exam, specifically palpation, and therein lies the problem for some payers and patients and referring providers. But why? Aren't many of the findings in medicine based on palpation? Of course, the answer to that question is yes, but it's, there's usually a way to verify it objectively. For example, if you take the pulse, that's done with a sense of feel, but it can be ver verified by Doppler ultrasound and other tools, 
You can even get on your smartwatch now. Manual therapists palpate for deep tissue spasm, as well as restricted joint motion and dysfunction, for which, for which there are no tools to reliably and objectively confirm those sometimes subtle palpatory findings of the examiner. What this means is it's highly dependent on the examiner and the inner rater reliability can vary widely, meaning that you're gonna have to trust or have a great deal of confidence in that provider's diagnostic digital acumen. Dr. Miller's now gonna talk about the guidelines and evidence-based literature regarding manual therapy and why we study it. Thank you, Dr. Lee. So as we just heard, there are many techniques involved in manual therapy. So how do we actually decide what we're looking at and what the evidence? Well, it turns out that in low back pain, the most common manual therapy would be manipulation, mobilization, and then also myofascial techniques. So most of the studies are based on that theme. What we found when we looked at the current evidence that is that the cost effectiveness is not really studied in the US. We found two quality studies. Uh, one was a systematic review, which included two studies from the UK and one from Finland. That concluded that from the patient's point of view, in other words, how satisfied the patient was and what the patient's function was using manual therapy versus not using it, it was very effective. And therefore, even though it showed a higher cost, it was more effective for the patient. There was another study done in Germany by Dr. Walker. There, they found that there was decreased sick time and decreased hospitalizations and very little difference in cost. Well, we don't know how any of that compares to the workers' compensation system in the US. And so our study is actually quite unique from that point of view. We also looked at the treatment guidelines just to see what is the most common way of viewing in the occupational medicine setting. And so if you look at this, you can see a common read versus official disability guidelines. And then I also put in Colorado as that is used in several other states. And you can see that um, all of these looked at evidence and they all came up with similar results. So basically four to six treatments are allowed. Usually then the functional gains are assessed. And if it looks as the patient's progressing, then you can go on to 10 or 12 treatments. And I guess importantly, we would see that most people agree that there is good evidence that manual therapy is at least equal to other therapies and therefore it is effective. So now we will listen to uh, Dong Chung as she explains to us our preliminary results and how we looked at this study. Thank you, Catherine. So in this study, we focus on manual therapy overall, regardless of type that are provided by non-chiropractic providers, we seek to address several questions. How prevalent is manual therapy when treating workers with low back pain? What are the common patterns of manual therapy treatment and how do they vary across states? Does early manual therapy make a difference in terms of costs and TD duration? And how do cost and TD duration compare between two groups of low back claims with PT, one with manual therapy and the other one without. So we find that manual therapy treatment was common for low back pain and the prevalence rate varied considerably across states. For workers with manual therapy treatment, the manual therapy treatments were usually initiated during first week of PT care. And in most cases, the manual therapy treatment duration was under six weeks. We also found that early manual therapy is associated with lower cost and shorter TD duration when compared with late manual therapy. And for workers receiving manual therapy treatment, they usually we see uh, they had higher cost and slightly longer TD duration when compared with those who had, man, who had PT, but did not have manual therapy. So let's look at the prevalence first. This chart shows the percentage of low back claims with PT. That's the total height of the bars. And the yellow portion of the bars are the claims that have manual therapy services. And the dark blue, are the claims that have non-manual therapy PT services. Those are the services including the uh, PT evaluation assessment, 
physical modalities and therapeutic exercise. So you can see that for workers with PT, most of them, they do receive manual therapy. And when we look at prevalence rate, which is the yellow, the height of the yellow bars, we can see considerable, considerable variation across states from 13% in Arkansas to 46% in uh, New Mexico. And this is based on all medical claims. So if we were to look at claims with lost time, the numbers are higher, but the patterns are similar. So when manual therapy is ordered, most of the time, manual therapy treatments were initiated in the first weeks of PT care. And by the end of second week of PT care, from 80% to 90% of the workers with low back pain that had manual therapy already had manual therapy started. So how about duration? And here we show the percentage of low back claims with manual therapy uh, that had manual therapy treatment duration less than or equal to six weeks. And you can see that most of states fall in this narrow range from, 80 to, from 60 to 80%. And New York was exception. In New York, actually 46% of the workers with manual therapy, they had manual therapy under six weeks. So if you flip it, uh, we're talking about 54% of the claims in New York that had manual therapy and received manual therapy for longer than six weeks of duration. And at the other end of the spectrum, we see Texas, where a vast majority of the claims, when they had manual therapy, they had manual therapy under six weeks. So we put these two states side by side, New York and Texas, and we also put 28 states median here for reference. And the top two measures we have already seen in the previous slides, and now we are adding the uh, total number of manual therapy visits. And we also showing here are the initial episode of care for manual therapy. And uh, we're talking about frequency, which is number of manual therapy visits. And we're talking about uh, duration, number of weeks. And we also talk about in, uh, intensity measured as number of manual therapy visits per week. So you can see that um, in New York overall, the, uh, the average worker had 15.5 visits for manual, th manual therapy services, which is in contrast with 3.4 in Texas and 6.5 in the median of 20, 28 states. And when we look at initial care, workers in New York, they also had higher number of visits for manual therapy services over a uh, longer duration. But the intensity, the number of manual therapy visits per week is similar. And it's similar across the, uh, the states that we see. So some of the state policies and uh, some of the environmental factors that may help to explain why New York has higher utilization of manual therapy, but that would be a topic for another day. So let's step back to just briefly talk about data and uh, approach. Since this section is fairly uh, self-explanatory, so we're not going to spend any time on this. Um, other than just, I just wanted to say a couple of words about statistical analysis that help to address two questions. So, so the first question is whether early manual therapy matter. And the second question that we're trying to address is uh, how the cost and TD duration compare with the, uh, between claims with manual therapy and claims without manual therapy. So the basic idea here is to control for various factors that may affect treatment choice and outcomes so that when we report, the results are going to be based on a comparison of, just, of adjusted data as if we're looking at similar claims between two different treatment groups. So in the next two slides, we're going to show some of the results from our statistical analysis. 
This one is a uh, comparison between early and late manual therapy services. Since this is different measures, so let me just spend a minute to set, set this up. So what we're seeing here is the percent difference, percent difference between early and late manual therapy. Um, in cost, where we have three cost measures here on the right, medical costs per claim, indemnity to payments, and TD duration. And we use two week as a threshold um, to define early versus late manual therapy. So because claims with early manual therapy, they have lower costs and shorter TD duration. So when we talk about percent difference in this relative term, you can see that all the figures are in the negative range below zero. And on the left, we have the unadjusted measures, unadjusted results, and on the right, we have adjusted. And you can see that the after we adjusted for many factors that may affect treatment choice and outcomes, we see that the size of the difference was reduced and was reduced for all three measures. But the direction is still the same. So the evidence basically suggests that early manual therapy is associated with lower costs and shorter TD duration than the late manual therapy. The same layout here, but now we're comparing claims with manual therapy and claims with no manual therapy. And we're still talking about three uh, same outcomes, medical cost, indemnity payments, and TD duration. And because claims with manual therapy, they tend to have higher cost and longer TD duration. So that's why you see all the numbers are in the positive range um, above zero. Um, again, on the left, you see unadjusted results and adjusted results on the right. And so after the adjustment, the size of the difference was reduced and reduced dramatically, especially for the indemnity payments and TD duration. But again, the direction remains the same. So based on our data, we basically conclude that low back pain claims with manual therapy, they had higher cost and slightly longer TD duration than those who had physical therapy but did not receive manual therapy. So a couple of things you may take away from this preliminary, uh, uh, preliminary findings. First, we see a large interstate variation in the utilization of manual therapy services. States with substantially higher utilization of manual therapy services should investigate possible underlying reasons and check if the higher utilization is justified with desired outcome. Second, when manual therapy is determined to be beneficial for workers with low back pain, early initiation is likely to be help, helpful to achieve lower cost and shorter TD duration. Lastly, our results showed that low back pain cases with, with manual therapy tend to have higher cost and slightly longer TD duration when compared with those that did not have manual therapy. But I should note here that um, the results we show are basically comparing the cost and TD duration at 18 months of follow-up as if we're looking at similar cases between manual therapy and no manual therapy groups. It is by no means enough to address the question about cost effectiveness of manual therapy. To determine quality of outcomes, we would need data on, for example, the uh, recurrence rate of low back pain and patient recorded outcomes. And these outcomes should be evaluated over a longer period of time. But this is the first study that focused on workers' comp population, as Dr. Mueller mentioned early on. And we do believe that it is a good starting point for this rather under-researched topic. So with that, I'm wrapping up our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Randy, Catherine, and Dong Chun.
Uh, I learned quite a bit about manual therapy from this presentation, and I'm sure the audience did as well. So we have several questions, and um, I'm going to start by posing one to Randy Lee. Um, Mark asked why chiropractic care was excluded from the study. Uh, Randy? Well, the original part of the study, the focus of the study and scope of the study initially was around physical therapy and manual therapy providers, non-chiropractic. There wasn't any explicit reason we did that other than the fact that I will say that it's one of the follow-up studies. I think that's going to be the third study that we do is, is chiropractic care. So that'll be some part of it. Dong Chong, did you want to add something to that as well? Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, as Randy said, that's going to be part of our uh, one of our subsequent studies. And, uh, and also the reason that we excluded, because when we talk about manual therapy, uh, the practice patterns are different between the chiropractors and non-chiropractors. And to just be more specific, we are talking about non-chiropractic non providers because we can clearly, clearly define chiropractic care, but uh, our data uh, does not provide, uh, well, it's not consistent enough or specific enough for us to uh, separate out physical therapists from the physicians and other medical providers. So that's why we're doing manual therapy by non-chiropractic providers, but vast majority of the uh, non-chiropractic providers are actually physical therapists. Thank you, Dong Chan. So here's a question, Catherine, that I'm going to pose to you. Uh, how are manual therapies addressed in guidelines? So because the code for manual therapy um, encompasses uh, multiple things, as Dr. Lee has already described to us, uh, it makes it a little bit difficult. Most of the time in the guidelines, as I mentioned, they're actually talking about, particularly for low back, they're talking about mobilization, but basically mobilization and manipulation. So one thing to think about is when we put guidelines together, we're actually looking at um, does it what would be the next choice if we didn't choose this. So since we said that it's equal to other treatments, um, you'll find that guidelines such as in Colorado actually may demand it for certain diagnoses in low back, which we do. So we actually require it for SI joint dysfunction before you could proceed to a more invasive procedure. So that's sort of an interesting concept to think about regarding manual therapy is that um, you try and do things that have less problems before you go to invasive procedures that would have more problems. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, you broke up a little bit, but I think that was pretty clear. Um, so Tim has asked about um, uh, the difference between uh, Texas and New York, and he asked whether uh, manual therapy visits and duration rates um, are low in Texas as compared to New York because of more restricted, restrictive utilization treatment guidelines. Um, what, uh, Dong Chun or Randy Lee, would you like to tackle that one? You want to go first, Randy? Well, I mean, I, the short answer is we're not completely sure uh, exactly why they're less. Uh, there are, because uh, once again, we haven't done a deep dive on those. Uh, so I was hoping to, I was hoping to get in first and say, Dong Chung, do you want to answer that question? But uh, she beat me to the punch. So, uh, so I, I can't give you a, Tim, I wish I could give you a better okay. response, but I can't. Yeah, to just add to what Randy uh, uh, was talking about. Actually, I did have a chance to ask of uh, two of my colleagues at WCRI who are doing a comp scope study, and they're very familiar with the uh, situation in, in Texas. So uh, mostly uh, it's highly likely that this would be due to the uh, utilization review that were put in place somewhere in the 2005-2006 in Texas uh, that basically says that physical therapy service, uh, services, if you have six visits for PT, uh, you can just go ahead and do it without any authorization. But beyond uh, six, uh, six visits, uh, you have to go through pre-authorization process. So sort of a... Um, that's likely to be the contributing factor to this in Texas. Though Randy, uh, Randy really says it uh, correctly for New York that um, we don't really have a clear idea about 
why New York had higher utilization uh, of manual therapy services and also PT services. Um, they do have low back treatment guidelines and their fee schedule is relatively low, but uh, we're still investigating as to why uh, the situation that we see in New York. Thank you, Dongshan. So John asks a question probably best uh, answered by one of the medical doctors. Um, so uh, do you think baseline strength pre-injury would be a factor to use in evaluating low back pain outcomes from manual therapy? Uh, <clears throat> well, we do use function as an important quality outcome. So um, that might be one thing. I think we'd also look at other functions reported by the patient besides strength. Um, to determine whether their actual quality of life overall was better than it was before. Uh, okay. John, one of, that, one of the things that one of the things that I would say about that is sometimes that, uh, or oftentimes back. now, really has something to add. <laughs> uh, there's something. Um, there, there is something to be said for pre-placement post off or strength testing so that you get a baseline when the patient comes in. That way, if they get injured, you can either use that as, you know, compare their injured state with baseline and rehab them back to baseline. So that may be what that question is getting at, what John's trying to get at. I'm not sure, but I, that may have something to do with it. And there's validity in that. I mean, that's one way to assess function uh, objectively and then set a goal and you, you're not trying to rehab them beyond reason. So, Dong Chun, this one it goes to you from Greg. Did you compare costs and duration of early manual therapy rather than all manual therapy compared to claims with PT, but no manual therapy? Uh, actually, we uh, compare, we, we actually address two questions. So the first one is among those injured workers who had manual therapy as part of PT, uh, whether early manual therapy uh, makes any difference. Uh, so that's the first question. Uh, we answer that. And also the second question, we also look at uh, the two groups of low back claims one with manual therapy, one without manual therapy, and see what's the cost and TD duration that are associated with um, uh, with you know uh, claims with manual therapy and how that compare with those who uh, do not have manual therapy. So we have those. Uh, uh, we sort of trying to answer both questions. Great, thank you. Uh, Tim has another question. Are more severe low back pain cases more likely to have manual therapy than less severe cases? And maybe that could relate to the longer duration that you see in the data? Uh, I, can yeah. I can take this question. It's a good question. Uh, we do see that uh, claims who had like a late manual therapy or had manual therapy, they tend to be uh, more serious. You know, for example, we see higher a proportion of low back claims who had like a nerve involvement uh, with the low back pain. So, but uh, in our statistical analysis, we basically um, adjust using a statistical technique to adjust, to adjust for the differences in the, the, in the cases in terms of severity, in terms of comorbidity, and in terms of case mix, and, and in terms of some of the sort of a regional factors, environmental factors, as well as provider practices uh, and availability of certain provider specialties uh, to adjust for the differences between the two groups of cases. So the, the results we are pre presenting uh, on the slides are basically the adjusted results are coming from the uh, our statistical analysis, which basically um, we're looking at that as if you're looking at similar cases uh, between the two groups. All right, um, one last question. Uh, uh, this one coming from Barry, it's really about studies um, that are out in the literature. Are there any studies showing how this modality or all modalities correlate with surgery rates? In particular, is more physical therapy safe for low back herniated discs associated with lower surgery rates? Uh, Catherine? 
Catherine. I am right. not aware of a study that that would uh, prove that. Um, initially, um, it was a lot of physicians felt aware of a study that would show that it would actually reduce the rate. Interesting question. All right. Well, I. There are some other great questions that unfortunately we didn't get a chance to answer in this Q&A. I wanted to thank um, Drs. Lee, Drs. Miller, and Dong Chung Wang, WCRI's own, uh, for this excellent presentation and Q&A. Um, our last session will start at 3.15, where I have a conversation with Dr. John Howard, the director of the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. Hope to see you then. Thank you.